Trenton Garland here. I'm putting this platform out. This is recorded, being recorded on February the 15th of 2024. But the intentions are for the county governments to have really a restoration of power. And should Jesus tarry to 2030, and God wills for me to be positioned to run for governor, is to fulfill this platform's articulation in the public forum with an awareness that you don't always prevail, but it's good to try and to share and to be willing to have the faith to win by doing the process. And so here in 2024, these are the things that I would modify today and I'll edit and make this an organic working document I know, say, for instance, the mayor of Springville uh, has announced he's going to run for governor, and I'd love to see him do that. And other people that are in politics, that hey, if I were to perish, they may just pick up on some of these uh, portions. His name is Dave Thomas, like the Wendy's guy, but a different Dave. They may pick up on some of these teachings and some of the constitutional principles that are held within this platform here. So Trent for Governor 2030, Alabama the beautiful, because we have world-renowned cotton and we would reinstitute a world-renowned cotton standard. We have the nation's premier port being there down in Mobile, uh, naturally protected by the peninsula of Florida. We have the states, we'll have the states and work for the best infrastructure of the state. And I would like to see the friendliest civil services, specifically given Alabama's known to be a hospitable state, being in the south, southeastern culture. The first thing that I would focus on, agriculturally speaking, is a tax incentive program for those who are domestically farming, planting, harvesting, selling uh, corn, cotton, and hemp. And indisputably and unapologetically, we would push for corn, cotton, and hemp even with some of the history of the concerns over the agricultural industry in Alabama, because we're proud of our cotton. We're proud of the type of land that we've been given here. And there's an indisputable clear infrastructure from North Alabama down out of the ports of Mobile, which would make it a domestically traded staple. No traffic tickets on Sunday or federal holidays, primarily because the principle of liberty transcends any taxation benefit wherein the, those infringements become systematic. And even though we call it a ticket, it's a tax, although it's instituted and worked by way typically of municipal corporations, but even county officials. So obviously pulling people over would still be within the bounds of the law, but as part of my platform in the campaign for governor, I would decentivize taxing the people over precautionary ordinances and literally start that by way of having no traffic tickets. You can have warnings on Sundays and federal holidays, pull the people over, unless it's reckless driving or DUI. I'd have an 80 only lane on the interstate. I'll integrate a little more with regards to uh, driverless vehicles and artificial intelligence. But the left-hand lane can facilitate 80 only. The reason I would say 80 only is because the right-hand lane can do slow or fast passes but if you have one lane on the interstate within the state that uh, has a minimum that's in excess of the, the re normal traffic flow that would be going slower, what you're doing is you're building a system based off of maximum amount of averages, if you will, of safe speed, 80 minimum, and the vehicles are designed to have a higher threshold of speed than was in the 60s and 70s when these were set. Driving under the influence, I would totally reform as a traffic ordinance violation unless there was personal injury, wrongful death, or property damage involved. There's no criminal intent. There are medical conditions too, which transcend the constitutional ordinance as it currently is, which includes auto brewery syndrome. Some people just from eating bread, specifically enriched bread, but have enough conversion of that blood alcohol to trigger a, a, a positive. So part of the reform, which includes also the machine reform, and let it be noted as part of this video, the reason I'm doing this, among others, 
is just to ensure that my competency and evaluation of perspectives is continually shared in the open marketplace. The institution of the current DUI law and the use of a machine per se in citizen encounters was a major and continues to be a major constitutional flaw because refusing to take a machine test and or failing a machine test that has a known error rate and creating a constitutional conviction position because of a per se finding by statutory law is unconstitutional, meaning that if a machine rate has an error of say 0.1 and you require all citizens to submit to the machines 0.1 with a de facto finding of some type of admission of guilt or presumption of guilt, that's an unconstitutional law. So the first part of reform within the DUI laws would be the decriminalize them unless there's an injury, wrongful death, or damage to property, and get away, get totally away from machine-centered administration of justice and trust that not only are the officers competent, but the video tests, and if there is an incentive, it would be for a simulation, putting people in the back of a vehicle. If you're going to do anything, give them a simulated opportunity, not simply a blood alcohol test. Uh, traffic system audits for cities to receive state funding, they would need to have proof that they've audited by way of the appropriate engineers, their city traffic light system. Uh, I would recommend that that be pitched out in every three years, but probably 10. That does multiple things that de-incentivize taxing people for false and pretentious uh, cautionary basis. It also creates job opportunities for those who would be going out and would be updating the traffic systems and doing the audits of the traffic lots. Additionally speaking, what is not taken into consideration with much of the machine driven uh, traffic flow, and I've visited India, been to Africa five times, India three times, seeing how traffic works in other countries. Uh, we can drive just as good in, Al in Alabama as I can in India. And they don't rely on a light to turn from green to red to tell them every time they need to safely proceed. So it literally de incentivizes the taxation system of precautionary traffic ordinances uh, by having a state auditory system. You're going to be audited, or you need to report on your own traffic lights and receive no state funding if you haven't updated your traffic lights. Deputize and defund municipal police. I would propose and ask the legislature to send a bill over that allows for each city to vote if they want to deputize and defund their police department. That city police department. It would not mean that you lose 100 officers, but it would mean that there'd be a ratio of private citizens deputized to those municipal corporate officers who at that point were deemed by the, the totality of the corpus within that city, within that voting district to be corrupt, just like a business. Uh, if there's a health license that needs to be pulled, if there are issues related to credibility of reporting, businesses get shut down, departments can be shut down. A municipal corporation that has a tendency to be violent with its people, otherwise give taxation without representation through precautionary uh, ordinance, pullover, traffic stops, folks who are getting thrown in jail over a garbage bill, when you get officers go out serving a warrant or telling people to show up for a city court setting and you're gonna go to jail. The people can speak back with deputizing and defunding, which is returning to constitutional government as well, because you take your sole constitutional necessary law enforcement officer of the county sheriff and you empower him with an annual renewal of who's an actual deputy on the books on the payroll and who is the principal at the elementary school that's a deputized citizen and for every one officer that is defunded with the city police department you would have two whether it be a postman a plumber or electrician you would have two dads and moms that are out in the working world become deputized and a strict control of the literal badges that they would carry with them would be something that would be a part of that reform. And that is a city by city ballot initiative. The city decide do they want deputies that are private citizens or they want to still have their police force that have nothing to do with civil services such as garbage, 
your uh, water or fire or paramedics, anything related to other civil services. And again, it does not decrease the number of law enforcement officers in those municipalities. In fact, it shifts the number of law enforcement officers and it saves the city's money. So it brings about justice, I believe, in a necessary reform. Because again, cities are corporations. They can be run well and they can represent the will of the people. But once they systematically and systemically encroach on the rights of the people, the only way for reform many times is absolute dissection with the hope that, you know, maybe the police department would be re uh, incentivized and reformed and come back into life after some other vote. But that would be something that I would put before legislature with the request that they pass it, if anything, to disincentivize continued police brutality, continued surveillance state tactics, and continued taxation, even though they're called uh, ordinance fines or fees or whatever they want to refer to it as, it is a tax. County and docket uh, disbandment of municipal courts, I would propose the civil release part that there be a total prohibition against civil releases being related in any form or capacity to a plea deal. And the very practice of a court offering that you sign a civil release and will dismiss the charges is corrupt per se. And so I would offer the legislature to come up with some type of reform, a bill to disincentivize this corrupt racketous practice if someone needs to be charged and need to be charged and prosecuted, if someone doesn't need to be charged and the officer violated their civil rights and overcharged them or did charge them to cover up a breach, there does not need to be a forced civil release process tolerated by the courts, municipal courts. And that is a problem. I'd end the ticket mills and garbage fee arrest. If someone issues a garbage bill that's not paid, municipally speaking, uh, the person should not go to jail because they can't go to a docket uh, in the county court. They should have to go to the county magistrate to issue those, those arrests because those are civil debts. And for it to go through the county would require an actual county constitutional warrant to be issued. So I'd end the, ta the traffic mules and the garbage fee arrests by way of requiring that only ordinance arrests, if they're going to claim some FTA, they have to take that FTA up through the county clerk. Prison reform, I would do a work release for nonviolent offenders uh, with an immediate recalculation of, of their time due. Uh, there's no, I would not allow or I would request and not allow for folks to be sitting around in a jail cell or walking in common areas sucking up air, sucking up food, sucking up water, and sucking up the oversight time without having to work. Uh, there is a very basic principle of country proverb, you don't work, you don't eat. So nonviolent offenders, uh, I would force them out into work, and that would be a means through which people additionally could advance to a literal work release program. No deadly intent offenders, I would have uh, work releases that are not releases from detention, but they serve as trustees and can actually go a certain times uh, per month. Now, these are nonviolent people uh, and can, can work under the supervision of a, obviously a deputy. The GPS ankles that are available today, ankles that are available for nonviolent offenders, uh, should be incentivized. So rather than having, because you get felony state laws as well, rather than having people locked down Monday through Friday and no work being done, the GPS anklet monitors a clear route uh, for jail and prison reform and for allowing for human resources to be utilized. It's arguable that the United States of America has 1.8 million illegally detained or unlawfully detained citizens. And those are people missing birthdays. We got 2.2 million detainees. It can be argued compared to other first world countries that nonviolent offenders, substance based offenders, or domestic order offenders, uh, those folks are indentured servants. If you just strictly evaluate the economics of the matter, 
it makes more sense to put them through work release programs. They used to even have conjugal visits for people who were actual offenders. What we've got so far, we're, we're taking them from their families, we're taking them from birthdays, and we're taking them from employers, at least restore them to employers with a GPS ankle monitor. This is from somebody who spent 195 days, I'd argue, unlawfully incarcerated. Based on law of non-contradiction, I'm presuming that that suffering will have an equal reward and benefit just based on what I've learned. I went from being in solitary confinement to uh, open dorm uh, in protective custody. Then I went to trustee status as working. Then I became a head of trustee, basically. had the clipboard with all the inventory for the entire jail. And it was a facility that got hit by a hurricane, so I ran it through that. Then I got released and did work release with an ankle monitor before I had a legal constitutional hearing. So kudos to that sheriff, but that took 14 hearings in 195 days. But I got to see how it would work, and the sheriff reinstituted an old program so that three ladies and myself, four of us, could get out and work. And I, I <laughs> polished garbage trucks was my job. <laughs> but it shows you the value of human labor in cultures all throughout history. You look at the Egyptians, they built pyramids with hand labor and we will always value human labor and that's the intent is to see the value in human labor and note that families need resources so the money that i earned went on my books the money earned from someone that would be serving out would be able to go either onto their books go to whatever person for support in the family that needs support and that incentive is there for them to work and earn I do probate court reform. I would ensure that only licensed uh, individual, licensed lawyers are serving on the probate courts for the purpose of re-encouraging more probate hearings. Uh, and anybody that's seated as a probate judge that doesn't have a law license, I would offer a scholarship program and grandfather program for them because there's no incompetent probate judges that I know of because they've received sufficient training, but it would just assist I believe the people are conducting of more probate hearings if you have licensed lawyers. I would encourage a new state constitution, scrap the 536 page one that we have. Indisputably, we have the longest living constitution in the world. That's an academic known fact. And so we are so bloated as a state that there's only two resources, two routes, if you will, you either scrap the entire constitution and come up with a new one, or the governor has to take a philosophy of encouraging the legislature to jam through so many new reform laws that the laws that are kind of the edges, the, the trimmings just end up not getting executed upon. And that's basically what we have now is we have, a, we have an unconstitutional state of law and we have a de facto in de jure the way it's executed uh, state. So we have so many programs, so many oversights, and laws not in force. If you look at adultery still in the books, nobody enforces that. Uh, a lot of times perjury is not enforced. So the two methods for reform would be to push through new laws or breathe life into the constitutional laws that we have by expanding them or expanding the powers of some of the departments through statutory expansions or scrapping and starting over with a completely new constitution, which would be very difficult to do, but that would be the idea. Reform the domestic and family laws by mitigating the tax that are on families, by recodifying to domestic disturbances. Any incident where a call is made to the home is coded as domestic violence, and that is unfair to mothers and to children and to fathers. If a mama gets to yelling at a kid, that ain't domestic violence. That may be a domestic disturbance, but I'll be damned if on my watch, if Jesus is tearing in 2030, that I would let this governor, that stuff continue because there are hundreds upon hundreds of reports created each week, each month, that is saying categorically, we investigated domestic violence. And sometimes a phone call may just literally say, Sally got mad and was yelling and was drinking and hollering. Well, they, they put domestic violence and there was no act of violence. And that's a major implication. Systemically, it needs to be corrected. So I would reform that. 
I'd also have a clear policy that says any municipality or encourages the legislature to push a bill through that there is no one party must go to jail policy adopted by any county department or any municipal police department. Just because your police department gets a call and somebody has to load up in the vehicle and go out there, they're already riding around anyway. There's plenty of police. There's no shortage of law enforcement. That's a farce. Just because somebody shows up to do a civil service, it's supposed to be serve and protect, not survey and arrest. So the one party must go to jail. That's not a real law. That's a policy. It's used by poorly trained officers and cited as if it's law because they're poorly trained. They think that they repeat what they were told and all of a sudden it'll make it law just because they say it. And so that's an unconstitutional policy that must go. Compulsory domestic intervention governance of the Department of Human Resources. DHR should by all means continue to exist. I do not agree with people that say we should totally scrap DHR. The DHR being compulsory is unfair. It's very similar to the homeschool system. To require somebody to put their kid in a, into a public school is unfair if they won't have homeschool. If the Department of Human Resources is at a place where they believe they should be involved, it should not be compulsory. People should have the right for their pastor, uh, their imam, their rabbi to serve the same purpose by recommending a counselor or they themselves serving the purpose of what the domestic uh, human resource department is claiming that they're doing by compulsory obligation. So that would cut back on the socialized domestication of the roles, both father and mother, and it would re-incentivize freedom of association, freedom of religion and liberty and that includes the rights of the children. The other thing that I would do is I would assure that there not only is a reassessment of availability of nonprofit services, thereby, thereby not requiring compulsory DHR involvement, but I would ensure that there were laws that made the execution of budgetary reduction where bloated the Department of Human Resources is but the reallocation of those monies, I think, would be best spent by allowing caseworkers to be educated in raising the standards of, of minimums that if you're going to come in and give an assessment, you need to have a bachelor's degree. We do not need someone coming in uh, without the proper education and giving an expert opinion just because they were hired by the Department of Human Resources. It does not make them an expert, but they're being received as if they're an expert. So I'm sure that those laws are considered by the legislature and potentially put through. I would re-examine also the felony false witness and fraud statutes. If anybody working for the county, Department of Human Resources, or any uh, false witness by an agent of the county, the number of people that affects is the number of charges that they should be charged with. It's no different than a, than a, a civilian being evaluated for a crime. If an agency worker bears false witness and it impacts a mother and a child, that's two acts of false witness. And just like anybody else, they should be charged. So there should be a reevaluation of the prosecution of felonies and false witness and fraud committed by purported agents of the state and of the county. They are not acting under color of law. And if it's prima facie false witness, and I've seen it with my own eyes as a lawyer, and I have had clients bring it to me in cases uh, when I was practicing. And I mean, seeing it as a lawyer done against other lawyers' clients. And I have seen it in my own situations personally. And I've heard of it and seen it with my own eyes in cases while I was an inmate waiting on dockets. So I've seen probably, you know, just as a lawyer, I had about 3,000 cases I evaluated and have had hundreds of others that I've sat in on court hearings. So it is not a constitutional question. An employee of an agency, when they commit false witness, that's a crime against the dad or mom and the child who's being withheld or otherwise, whatever the situation may be. So that's a reform to the compulsory Department of Human Resources. I'm not saying do not fund them. I'm saying beef up their funding and properly channel the resources and make available just like the homeschool alternative, make available a framework 
where families can win through the nonprofit services that are already available. I'd reform the notice statutes for cities and municipalities. Uh, there's a mechanism that requires 180 days uh, for that, 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 if you will, trap almost to be out there for citizens who do not know that they let the time toll off. So as compared to a standard case where if someone's injured, a uh, police officer shoots somebody, uh, the 180 day requirement is prohibiting good cases for proper redress from being sustained and uh, would encourage reform in that regard. I would reform the state and county agency immunity doctrine, which is currently considered the Cranman doctrine. That's bad law. Uh, it's being currently challenged in a case that's a public record. Clay Hornsby has it's a Davy case versus the Department of Public Safety. But the Cranman doctrine expanded not only from a county sheriff who was held to not be liable for a hanging that occurred, it's how it expanded originally, inmate was taken out, was hung, was a county sheriff responsible or not, to not only that was considered to be an immunity because he let the person be taken out, uh, but they've expanded it to clerks are not responsible if they intentionally disregard and even programs over, say, the um, Department of Human Resources in the Indian case where the folks had no opportunity to turn and sue the agent that came in for breach of uh, discretionary ministerial duties. So I would set aside cramming and just get back to the academic normals. Uh, you have immunity for discretionary duties where it's reasonable, have immunity for all ministerial duties, very basic. But Alabama has taken away the right to sue. And if the county agent or the state agent is innocent, they'll prevail in front of the jury. But to get back to constitutional government, you can't have these sovereign immunities intended for the state applied to agents of the state. The intention is that the state does not serve as a defendant because the state is the overall will of the people, but the individual people should be able to be sued and departments for which they work for. I would encourage a reset Alabama nature and wildlife bill be pushed through because effectively we're allowing a lot of the chemical companies from the past. I mean, you look at Goodyear, they were incentivizing dam it up waters. We've had other bases uh, of corporate America intervening with their intentions from not allowing natural law, natural water flow. And so because of that, we don't have the natural teeming of wildlife in our rivers and streams like we normally would but we've got one of the best agricultural maintenance school and maintenance schools in the country with Auburn and so many others. So rather than spending money as we have in other ways, uh, I would encourage the restoration of natural law, the benefit of natural teeming waters and have not only corn, cotton and cannabis be encouraged to be grown, but spend state resources stocking our ponds, stocking our streams, stocking our rivers and lakes, because there's no downside to that if it's done by an engineer from Auburn. So Alabama, the beautiful, cleanest state parks and restrooms in the country, call it wild and silly, but there's no reason not to have the best restrooms at the rest areas that we could possibly have. That takes very little effort and oversight world renowned cotton standard. I get certainly back to being proud that we have excellent cotton and we ain't ashamed of it because we've got the nation's premier port. And this is proposed for 2030, this is 2024. But these are the basics of how I think when you get back and you, you let out and you govern things in some areas and take the governor off in other areas, the constitution and the streams of commerce and people's competency and their presumed innocence will take care of uh, the, the rest. I mean, we don't need to have strict oversight of every citizen's civil or constitutional right. In fact, we have civil rights bubbles that should not be encroached on and are systemically being encroached on. I'd encourage the best state infrastructure with fast, free, safe, and well-maintained roadways. I think, of course, Cleanliness is next to godliness, and we have Southern hospitality. So that would be what I would push for uh, come 2030, should Jesus tarry. 
and that is my current platform as Trent for governor. It may seem obnoxious or just wild crazy to think that that could occur, uh, but I've been through such difficult situations with the government and represented several people. And some of what you've probably seen, if you've seen me in the news, is about a half of the story and none of it took me by surprise because most all of it you'll see at some point in time was either civil activism or some planned prank. And yes, I did represent Chief Justice of our state for seven years. And I uh, believe that I have the track record of success. Hall of Famers are in the three or four hundreds in Major League Baseball. So that would be my platform in 2030 to reform the state and to allow the Constitution and the people to thrive and I believe prosper.